Chapter 7 of Sermons of a Buddhist Abbot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Gavulla. Sermons of a Buddhist Abbot by Soyen Shaku. Translated by Daisets Teitaro Suzuki. Chapter 7. What is Buddhism? It seems to be very appropriate and even necessary at the outset to draw a well-defined line of demarcation between what is understood as Hinayana Buddhism and what is known as Mahayana Buddhism. Most people imagine that there is only one school of Buddhism and that that one school is no other than the Buddhism they have learned from the Buddhist books written or compiled or translated by Western Orientalists. Orientalists who are, in many respects, prejudiced against the doctrine which they propose to study most impartially. Owing to these unhappy circumstances, the outsiders are either generally ignorant or altogether misinformed of the true character of Buddhism. For what is understood by the Western people as Buddhism is no more than one of its main divisions, which only partially expresses the spirit of its founder. I said here divisions, but it may be more proper to say stages of development, for Buddhism, like so many other religions, has gone through several stages of development before it has attained the present state of perfection among the Oriental nations. And it will be evident to you that if we catch only a glimpse of an object and try to judge the whole from this transient impression, we place ourselves in a most awkward position and shall be at a loss how to extricate ourselves from it. Therefore, let me try in the beginning to take a comprehensive view of the subject we here propose to expound. Properly speaking, Hinayana Buddhism is a phase of Mahayana Buddhism. The former is preparatory for the latter. It is not final, but merely a stepping stone which leads the walker to the hall of perfect truth. Hinayanism is therefore more or less pessimistic, ascetic, ethical, to be distinguished from religious, and monastical, it fails to give a complete satisfaction to a man's religious yearnings. It does not fully interpret the spirit of Buddha. The Buddhism now prevailing in Ceylon, Burma, and Siam may be considered to be betraying in a certain way a Hinayana tendency. The Buddhism of present Japan, on the other hand, is Mahayanistic. It is more comprehensive more religious, more humanistic, and more satisfying to the innermost needs of the religious consciousness. It cannot be said to be absolutely free from superstition, error, prejudice, etc., for it is a constantly growing, ever-living faith, which knows no ossification or fossilization. Some pious people are apt to consider their religious belief to be absolutely fixed and unchanging since the dawn of human consciousness, but they have forgotten, in my opinion, the fact that the human mind is still keeping on unfolding itself, that it has not yet exhausted all its possibilities, that it is constantly coming to a clearer consciousness as to its own nature, origin, and destiny. But what I firmly believe is that in the Buddhism of Japan today are epitomized all the essential results reached through the unfolding of the religious consciousness during the past twenty or thirty centuries of Oriental culture. In a word, what has been known in the West as the teaching of Buddha does not represent it in its true unadulterated color, for it is Hinayanistic in tendency. That is, it is exclusive and not comprehensive, narrow and limited, and not all absorbing and assimilating. What I propose to expound in this lecture tonight is the Mahayana Buddhism, so called by Buddhist scholars of the East. 
Let me point out in this connection what is most characteristic of Buddhism as distinguished from any other religion. I refer to a predominant tendency of Buddhism toward intellectuality, and it seems to me that the reason why Buddhism is always ready to stand before the tribunal of science and let her pass a judgment upon its merits or demerits is due to this intellectual tenor. It goes without saying that the intellect does not constitute the most essential element of religion, but we must not forget that a religious system too much given up to sentimentalism, understanding it in its purely psychological sense, is generally prone to accede to unwarranted mysticism, ignoring altogether the legitimate claim of the intellect. Buddhism is fortunately saved from this grievous blunder, and always endeavors not to give a free rein to the wantonness of imagination and the irrationality of affection. Love without enlightenment excludes, discriminates, and contradicts itself. Love is not love unless it is purified in the mill of spiritual insight and intellectual discrimination. What are, then, the fundamental teachings of Buddhism? I deem it best to consider it from two standpoints, ethical and philosophical, or practical and speculative, or affective and intellectual. The philosophical or speculative is preparative for the ethical or practical, for religion is not a system of metaphysics which plays with verbalism and delights in sophistry, but its aim is preeminently practical and spiritual. It must bear fruit in this our everyday life. To begin with the metaphysical side of Buddhism, 1. We Buddhists believe that as far as phenomenality goes, things that exist are all separate and discrete. They are subject to the law of individuation and therefore to that of limitation also. All particular things exist in time and space and move according to the law of cause and effect, not only physically but morally. Buddhism does not, though sometimes understood by Western people to do so, advocate the doctrine of emptiness or annihilation. It most assuredly recognizes the multitudinousness and reality of phenomena. This world as it is, is real, not void. This life as we live it, is true and not a dream. 2. We Buddhists believe that all these particular things surrounding us come from one ultimate source, which is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving. The world is the expression or manifestation of this reason, or spirit, or life, whatever you may designate it. However diverse, therefore, things are, they all partake of the nature of the ultimate being, not only sentient beings, but non-sentient beings reflect the glory of the original reason. Not only man, but even the lower animals and inorganic substances manifest the divinity of their source. To use the Christian term, God, it is visible and audible not only in one of its highest manifestations, whom Christians call Jesus Christ, but also in the meanest and most insignificant piece of stone lying in a deserted field. Footnote. Let me remark here that it is not at all proper to refer to God, the ultimate source of everything, as masculine, as is usually done. God is above sex. It is neither he nor she. Even it is not appropriate, but will be preferable to the other pronoun. End footnote. God's splendor is seen not only in the biblical lilies, but also in the mud and mire from which they grow. The melody of divine reason is heard not only in the singing of a bird or in the composition of an inspired musician, but also in the 
slums of life, as Emerson phrases it. 3. This recognition of the oneness of things naturally leads to our third belief, that the one is the many, and the many is the one. God does not dwell in the heavens. It does not direct its affairs in a closed office situated somewhere outside this world. It did not create heaven and earth out of nothingness. According to Buddhism, it is a serious error to seek God outside this life, outside this universe. It is living right among ourselves and directing the course of things according to its innate destiny. Though Buddhists refuse to have God walk out of us, they do not identify it with the totality of existence. They are not willing to cast their lot with pantheists, so called. God is imminent, surely enough, but it is greater than the totality of things. For the world may pass away, the universe may be shaken out of its foundation, but God will remain and will create a new system out of the former ruins. The ashes of existence will never be scattered to the winds, but they will gather themselves in the ever-designing hand of God and build themselves up to a new order of things in which it is ever shining with its serene radiance. To sum up the first part of this discourse, what may be called the metaphysical phase of Buddhism is to recognize, one, the reality of the phenomenal world, two, the existence of one ultimate reason, and three, the imminence of this reason in the universe. Now to come to the practical side of Buddhism. The aim of Buddhism, to state it briefly, is to dispel the clouds of ignorance and to make shine the sun of enlightenment. We are selfish because we are ignorant as to the nature of self. We are addicted to the gratification of the passions because we are ignorant as to the destiny of humanity. We are quarrelsome and want to make ourselves powerful and predominant at the expense of our fellow beings because we are ignorant of the ultimate reason of the universe. Buddhists do not recognize any original sin but acknowledge the existence of ignorance and insist on its total removal as the surest means of salvation. Let us, therefore, all be enlightened as to the statement made before. Let us know that we are all one in the reason of the universe, that the phenomenal world is real only to the extent it manifests reason, that egoism has no absolute sway in this life, for it destroys itself when it tries to preserve itself through its arrogant assertion. And that perfect peace is only attained when I recognize myself in you and you in me. Let us all be enlightened as to these things, and our ignorance and egoism are forever departed. The wall that divides is destroyed, and there is nothing which prevents us from loving our enemies and the source of divine love is open in our hearts. The eternal current of sympathy has now found its unobstructed path. This is the reason why Buddhism is called the religion of enlightenment. Now that we stand on this eminence of religious sanctity, we know what Buddhist practical faith is. It is threefold. One, to cease from wrongdoing two, to promote goodness, and three, to enlighten the ignorant. Buddhist ethics is the simplest thing to practice in the world. It has nothing mysterious, nothing superstitious, nothing idolatrous, nothing supernatural. Stop doing anything wrong, which is against the reason of things. Do whatever is good, which advances the course of reason in this life, and finally, help those who are still behind and weary of life to realize enlightenment. And here is Buddhism in a nutshell. It has nothing to do with prayer and worship and singing and whatnot. 
Our simple everyday life of love and sympathy is all that is needed to be a good Buddhist. I was once asked whether there was such a thing as religious life particularly, to which my answer was simple enough. Attend to your daily business, do all you can for the promotion of goodness in this world, and out of fullness of heart help your fellow beings to gain the path of enlightenment. Outside of this, there cannot be anything to be specially called a religious life. In the latter part of the Tang dynasty in China, there was a famous poet statesman who is known in Japanese as Hak Rak Ten. He learned that there resided in his district a Buddhist monk greatly noted for his saintly life and scholarly learning. The governor went to see him, intending to discuss some deeply religious topics. As soon as he was ushered into the presence of the monk, he inquired what was thought by the saint to be the most fundamental teaching of Buddhism. The monk immediately replied that it is the teaching of all enlightened ones to cease doing anything evil, to promote goodness, and to purify one's own heart. Hak Rak Ten was nonplussed to receive such a commonplace instruction from the mouth of such a scholarly personage professing the faith of Buddha. For he secretly expected to have something highly metaphysical and profoundly speculative, which would naturally lead them to further philosophizing and contentless abstraction. The poet statesman therefore retorted, this is what every child of three summers is familiar with. I desire, on the other hand, what is most abstruse, most essential, most vital in Buddhism. The monk, however, coldly replied, Every child of three summers may know what I said now, but even a silvery-haired man of eighty winters finds it difficult to put the Buddhist instruction into the practice of everyday life and it is said that thereupon the governor reverentially bowed and went home wiser. What is philosophical in Buddhism is no more than a preliminary step toward what is practical in it. Every religion, if it deserves the name, must be essentially practical and conducive to the promotion of the general welfare and to the realization of reason. Though intellectualism is one of the most characteristic features of Buddhism, making it so distinct from any other religious system, it never forgets the fact that our religious consciousness ever demands something concrete, that which is visible to our senses, that which is observable in our everyday life. Religion does not necessarily consist in talking on such subjects as the continuation after death of individual personality, original sin committed by some mythical personages, the last judgment to be given by an unknown quantity, a special historical revelation which takes place in a congested brain and what not. At least, practical Buddhism does not trouble itself with solving these problems through speculation or imagination or sophistry. Let those theologians who delight in abstraction and supernaturalism discuss them to their heart's content, for that is their profession. We, plain, ordinary Buddhists, will keep on removing selfishness, seeking the light that is everywhere, practicing loving-kindness that does not contradict or discriminate. Says an ancient sage, The way is near, and thou seekest it afar. Why, then, shall we ever attempt to walk away from the path which extends right in front of us, so wide and well paved? End of chapter 7 Recording by William Gavulla